Uh, our instructor today will be the legendary Axel Grell, known uh, for designing such headphones as Sennheiser's HD 600, HD 650, 800, 800S, and the absolutely legendary HD1. Orpheus. <laughs> and Orpheus, yes. The HD1 Orpheus. Um, Yes, I've, I've done, made some headphones for Sennheiser. Just, just a few. <laughs> um, uh, uh, recently, Axel uh, struck out on his own uh, founding uh, Grell Audio, where he is both consulting and designing his own uh, headphones for sale. Um, there is probably no one better on the planet to pick their brain about how headphones work and uh, the theory behind them. So uh, without further ado, Axel Grell. Thank you very much. Um, welcome. So, uh, yes, headphones are heard by individuals, and we are very different. And so, how that, how that does that influence the things that we are hearing? And uh, yeah, so. Let's start with that. When we're listening to a natural sound field, so say natural is something where we are here, uh, and sound comes from sound sources through the air to us, it is formed by our yeah, body, our head, our nose, and our outer ears, and then it comes to our inner, uh, through the ear canal, middle ear, inner ear, and so on. But what we hear is, when the source is flat and frequency response, we all hear it is flat. But we all have these individual, as I call them, geometrical filters, as I said, formed by the, the body and so on, but mainly by our outer ears and our ear canal. And when you do measurements, at the ear entry point, uh, oh, I have water as well. Yes, uh, you see that this looks very different for different individuals. So, what we measure there is, yes, very different. That was me uh, these are measurements that were taken already in the 90s by. Um, Professor Möller from Aalborg, that's in Denmark, uh, with a, yes, con good conversations at that time already, and I got some good insights from his research as well. Um, yeah, you see, yeah, what is going on, what's happening here? A person uh, with frequency, measured frequency response like that, he's hearing the same, in the end, he's hearing the same flat response, but what is measured is, is much less. So there must be something uh, to let him hear the same thing. And what's going on is you have the sound, that is, say, frequency response while it's flat. Then you measure here, and you see these frequency responses. The inner ear, uh, middle ear, and inner ear has an influence as well. So this should be the, the ear that is. Uh, but you have an equalizer, and the equalizer is your brain. Your brain knows exactly how things sound and sets it the right way. And one side thing, when sound comes from different directions. The fre measured frequency response is different as well. So, but what happens when a sound source is moving? So, when when someone is talking to you and he's moving, does he have different frequency response? No. You know that there is a sound source moving in the room, and you detect the position, but your internal equalizer equalizes the frequency response to exactly the same. Um, frequency response from there as from there. Okay, when it's going somewhere behind you, it's a little bit different because uh, the sound, the higher frequencies are not, sometimes not coming to you loud enough to go over the threshold of, of uh, what you hear. But in total, everything is for you more or less flat. 
So brain is a, is a very good device. So. Okay, so everybody, everyone is hearing the, uh, with healthy hearing, and this is important when that hearing is, is defective, so it is uh, different. So when some regions of, uh, in the frequency uh, perception are really damaged, of course it's different. So the question is, what is happening uh, when listening to headphones? It depends on the type of headphone, but you are bypassing these filters, especially when you use in-ears. When you use bigger headphones with a larger area that uh, radiates the sound, your outer ear is part of the thing, but when you're really going directly in the ear canal, this filter is no longer active. So the designer of a headphone has to predict how this filter might work for an average user and where is the average and design the in-ear headphones to match with the yes, majority of listeners so that it sounds good for them. So I've picked two individual curves now. So I hope you can see them, the yellow one and the blue one. And it's both hard to find them out. It's all in black and white. And to find where is the curve was not that easy. So I've isolated them. And you see from the same sound source, person A is much more in this area than person B. And when person A is a designer for in ears and he creates something that sounds right for him in that area, and then uh, oh, person A here, it, he gives a lot more of sound pressure level than person B expects there. So when person A, so the designer says, okay, now it's great, it sounds wonderful to me. Uh, person B might not be amused by the sound. And it's not because the headphone is bad, but because they're hearing something differently. And uh, because when you see the difference between the curves, person B has 16 dB more in the range of 4.5 kilohertz than the designer of it. And that is something, uh, you don't want to have that in that frequency range, but that happens. And when you read reviews of in-ears and you see the discussions are going on about in-ears, you know there's nearly war between <laughs> listeners and groups. It's not that strong for other headphones. Okay, there are some struggle as well, of course. It, and that's a game. That's okay. But for in it's, yes, it's, it's really both persons have an opinion and both are right. Because, yes? Is there a specific frequency response where the variation is more common between person to person? Yeah, so I can... Uh, there are papers where, uh, so but it, the difference is the biggest in that range. And in the high frequency range, there are big differences as well, but they don't play the big role. So it's the most annoying here. So say between four and 10 kilohertz, somewhere there. Um, um, yes, please. <laughs> Would a good headphone designer have to hearing check and understand what their personal curve is? And, and is there any research that shows, uh, I mean, and maybe this is what the Harman curve is, what, what's the most common or what's kind of an average? Yeah, the Harman curve is an average, yeah. right. And an average is, is better than just a single person, of mm -hmm. course, um, because you have, yes, 
but you have always this curve of, of same um, perception in this case. So this Gauss curve, and you have, yes, the center. You're lucky when you're in the center, but when you're out of the center, at the, the edge is something really bad. Uh, but even when you're close or not as close to the center as, as the most should be. And for me, as a designer of headphones, it was always the good situation that I'm, yes, that average guy with the geometry of my ears. So uh, that what I hear is something that the average, yes, likes in a way. Okay, so how can that situation be solved? Okay, one thing is, and this is the usual way, to say, okay, this headphone is crap. I look for a different one uh, with a different tuning that matches my geometrical filters. That sounds good. Uh, yes, the, per uh, the person can buy over-ear headphones uh, because with over-ear headphones, that effect is not that big because, uh, as I said before, um, the outer ear is already part of the whole thing. And the bigger the diaphragm is and the bigger uh, the sound field is, the better that works. And this is the reason why planners and uh, electrostatics with big diaphragms sounds this is one of the reasons. Sounds for majority of listeners much better. It's, it's of course transients and all that, but it's the big moving area as well. That's much more than a natural sound field. And that was for me the reason to create this ring radiator for the HD800. So a diaphragm that is larger, so where, yes, more sound field wider sound field is created and more of, of the geometry of the listener's ear is, is used to form this filter. Okay, or he stays with an in-ear and he can use an equalizer to create that filter. Um, first he has to take out the tuning of person A, so the designer of it, and then he brings it his own frequency response curve. So when you have an equalizer, you can easily do that, parametric equalizer, 10 band, no problem for a sound engineer, but not everybody is a sound engineer. So the most people, when they're using uh, equalizers, the result is even worse uh, than it was before. So let's continue with solution three. Yeah, so it's not easy, so it would be very helpful to have an assistant to do that. And this is the way that I decided to go uh, for, yes, my new, new product, so this is product placement now for the Grell TWS slash one and for the Drop plus Grell TWS one X. And uh, so we have partnered up with Sonoworks, a company who um, come from studio technology. So they did, uh, when a sound engineer is traveling and is leaving his home studio and he, and he wants to have the same sound in a different studio, he takes his little uh, bag with a, a measurement microphone with him and let that algorithm run in the new studio. And then the sound is okay. There are always limits, but very similar to the sound that he have, has at home. Yes? What is this doing different than the auto EQ that is just a parametric EQ for every headphone? Just, just one second. Okay. Let, let me continue. And uh, so what the sound ID thing is doing, that is not doing something flat and you can't measure, really measure that. You have to always have the person listening to it and getting feedback. And so sound ID is doing it in a way that it, you can choose different music styles and playing music samples. Okay, this would be approved so that you may can use your own music as well. And then you have to decide is A better than B or is none of them better and what's going up. And this is for many, many things. What is going up that way and what's going 
uh, really is done in the background is that a parametric equalizer is set or a FER filter is set. So to match, to um, create exactly that curve uh, that you are expecting. So to take out that curve and to put in that curve. This is what what's happening there. And you don't have to be an uh, engineer to do that. So you just have to listen and say, OK, A is better, B is better, none of them is better, go to the next one. And uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So conclusions of that. A tuning following the listening preference of a single designer is not a good idea. An average frequency response is better. So something like the Hammond curve, of course. But it is not something that works for everybody. So when the majority says, OK, Hammond curve sounds good for me, uh, there might be some persons who say, no, not for me. It sounds not good. And the reason can see it here. And of course, one thing that is not in is, is personal preference. Um, the thing with the reviewer that says, OK, this one sounds uh, bad, and uh, the customer loves it, both are right. So because they are hearing different things. And uh, when designing headphones, uh, the individual ear geometries must be taken into account. So when the industry is doing in ears, they need to offer solutions uh, to Yes, bring this individual geometry filters somehow into the headphones. And uh, yeah, this is what we're doing uh, with Sonarworks with Sound ID. And uh, yeah, I hope there will be others doing that as well in a similar way. Or in a different way, and or maybe hopefully in a better way. <laughs> so uh, I think it's, it's worth to, to think about that, but, but what's not possible is to do a, just a measurement. So things like scanning the ear and doing photographies, that's a good way. So to see, okay, the geometry is looking like that, then we expect from measurements that it will have this or that effect. Uh, but for me in the moment, the best way is, okay, you know what you expect, how it should sound, and when you are giving feedback to an algorithm and say, OK, this sounds better to me, this sounds better to me, no, that sounds bad, and then the equalizer is set. So it is nothing, not only technical, it's a human factor is, is in there as well. Yes? Do you, in your opinion, do you think when you're listening to music, any frequencies above 20,000 hertz, could it affect the sound that we do here through harmonics or some other mechanism? Is it? The thing is that possible? Or is it just 20 hertz and that's it? Uh, most of us, I think, will not hear more there. We are mixed, so something like more than 15, 16 kilohertz. For me, it's 12, 12 and a half. Uh, so it's, it's age dependent. But I'm saying yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Just let me continue. Oh, sure. I, I'm not a polit politician, so I <laughs> answer your questions. <laughs> um, so, um, but we, we did some, some tests at Sennheiser when, when high-res came up. Uh, first, uh, we did recordings with Deutsche Grammophon, uh, high-res uh, recordings. Uh, that was in, in the 90s already. Uh, it was not that easy. We didn't have the DAX and the high sampling frequencies. That was all difficult, but we did it. And then we analyzed first only the spectrum of, of recordings. Is there something in the spectrum? Uh, yes, there is something in, and then we just did simple tests that we use in HE90, which is the old Orpheus, which is able to create frequencies up to 100 kilohertz. We didn't have the HE1 at that time, <laughs> and did listening tests with that, and had filters where we switched on and off above 20 kilohertz. And uh, that was a double-blind thing, and people should say uh, 
yeah, there's more, this is better or there's more or something. Just switching the switch is A better, B better. And uh, the result of that was, uh, it was more than 50% found uh, that the one that was open up, yes, until uh, the, the uh, limit frequency of the AG1, uh, AG90. So people have a sense for these higher frequencies somehow. We could not say why. Uh, the filters were made in a way that things were not mixed down or the, the, the uh, 20 kilohertz range was not affected by the filters. Uh, so yes, it has an effect, but I could not say why. But a, a different experiment that I did, <laughs> and that is something I created two headphones and I gave it to colleagues. Um, and say, okay, one has an extended frequency range. It goes up to 40 kilohertz or 50 or whatever, a d dynamic one, and the other one is normal. And what I really did is I created a resonator inside so that uh, brings up the frequencies at, I think, at 12 kilohertz, a little bit to 3 dB up, and then it goes down. So this is how resonators work. So for you in that direction, of course, here are the high frequencies. So 3 dB up and then really down, there was nearly nothing above 14 kilohertz. So of everybody who are listening to these two headphones has, okay, the one with the uh, filter red, so with the resonator, has extended frequency range. So amplitude, and frequency range, so yeah, so we don't have a really good sense for what's going on in that very high frequency range. But it's, you can, it, it, that was only scientific things, so it is, yeah. So, but these are not the final conclusions. Um, yes, they are, but things that I not have taken into account is uh, personal taste, of course, and the personal taste is uh, when we are thinking of a brain as the equalizer, uh, you are have a system that you're listening to. You're used to listen to that sound of that headphone, of that speaker system, whatever, and you like that. And when something is different, it's so when you like it and you listening to something different, it is worse. Uh, even if it is, might be better, it, uh, it doesn't fulfill your expectations. And this is the worst that could happen to someone. You have expectations and they are not fulfilled and then it's, oh, that's not good. All the psychoacoustical influences. So when you have a silver uh, colored headphone and a black colored headphone, guess which one is perceived with more highs? Silver. Right! <laughs> and this is something that is very well known so, uh, for a long time. So when you have a concert hall and paint it in, in uh, dark colors, it sounds darker. And, and when you paint it in bright colors, it sounds brighter. So, uh, yeah, so this is, plays all a role for our equalizer here. It's, it's not only the sound, but everything else. Uh, the fit, when something is hurting you, your ears, it is not good when well, the weight is too low, when the weight is too high it has an effect. Uh, the, the color, I said it already. And uh, one thing that is uh, not fully understood yet is the influence of the acoustical impedance of the headphone. So when we put something, so sound into the ear canal, okay, it goes in, but it, not everything remains in. It, not everything is absorbed by the eardrum. So there's something reflected. And uh, so when you close your ears with your hands, you hear, okay, something is happening. You hear something like that. Uh, when you put an in-ear in your ears, something is happening as well. And as Everett might have said, I don't know, when you have A and C, you can change the impedance of the headphone closing your ear canal. And this is the good thing about A and C, that this is not this kind of hard reflection. It's a little bit softer, but we have to work on that as well. And the more open the headphone is, the less reflections you get and 
the more natural it sounds. I have a project with the University of Hanover. Uh, we're working on that. So there are some papers out already uh, by Roman Schlieper. Uh, and uh, that's interesting, but it's not fully done. So it's, and um, I think that will influence how his headphones will, will sound in future as well. Yes, and the last thing is the interaction between the hearing apparatus and the headphones. So when, what is happening really in the ear when you wear a open type headphone, closed type, a big one, uh, something that is on ear or in ear. So we need to do some research there as well. So development at headphones is not really at its end. There's a lot of room for improvement. And uh, of course, companies need to make money with headphones, but the, the border can be shifted and to remain where we are now with something doesn't make sense. It could sound better. And uh, yeah, that's all. And the most important thing, And of course, the questions. Yep, we have about 20 minutes, so we got oh, a lot okay. of time. And I need water. <laughs> it seems like your focus is more on the people in the back. Oh, here's the mic. Oh. It seems like you're focusing a lot on the, the way that people hear the 4 to 10 kilohertz differently. Um, when I feel like there's a bigger difference in trying to tune each headphone to a target. So, are you assuming that you've already got the headphone tuned to a target before you do these tweaks? Um, and how are you handling that? So, what I do is, um, of course, I, in the beginning of a project, I have an idea how the headphone should sound. That is an idea in my head, so I can try to make a curve out of it, but uh, frequency, measured frequency response curves without knowing how the headphone looks like and which impedance it has, so the acoustical impedance it has and all that doesn't make sense. So yes, f for uh, the specifications I always have to draw something. That's <laughs> but in the end uh, I try to come close to uh, my idea, of course, but without uh, many test listeners who say, okay, it sounds for me like that and that matches what I want to achieve. It doesn't make sense as well. So this is, uh, as I said, in the end, humans are listening to the headphones and need, it need to sound good to, to human beings. Uh, different ages, different listening experience. When, when I know, okay, it's only for heavy metal fans, so it's easier because uh, this is uh, just one genre and one expectation. No, it's not only one, but uh, it's, it's more limited than when you have to do something very general. Because expectations, as I said, when they are not fulfilled, this is the worst that could happen. So when you can't hear uh, the guitar uh, from a heavy metal headphone and you just he hear the drum and the bass, you say, okay, this is not a heavy metal headphone, that is a hip hop headphone. So yeah, of course you can hear the guitar, but it's not in the front. So things like that. And uh, yeah, I hope this answers your, qu your question, but it's close. I think I'm thinking of it in terms of like other people, like any headphone, right? It's, is this EQ used for any headphone? So, or just your headphones? No, uh, just mine. But oh, okay. in the end, in the end, when you're going to, to uh, sound ID, it's a very personal thing that only works with that headphone and that person, and that's it. So, but it could be any headphone. No. No, not any. No. Okay. no. Okay. It, it works only with that headphone, okay, with that special works. thing. Yeah, because that has its own uh, characteristic, of course, and it has its own influence on the listener. So when you do the same uh, equalizer for uh, open on-ear, as you use it for uh, in-ear, it, it will be very different. Okay, yes? Oh, sorry. 
Hi. So uh, something really interesting. So with audio files, one kind of uh, standard people listeners want is kind of that natural sound, like what sounds natural. And I always assume that flat is kind of what's the natural, you know, basis of it. But I, I was kind of wondering, what's your insight when uh, when creating the HE1? Because some people regard the HE1, you know, the Orpheus tonality, as to be like super natural and the best like tonality on a headphone which is why it, uh, it gets the name as the world's best headphone because in terms of pure tuning, it sounds very natural to people and I think with it, it seems to kind of adhere to Harman a bit. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly to the target, but it seems to be very agreeable with most people. But yeah, what's your insight on how that tuning was created for the HE1 and how that, could, that kind of tuning could help maybe with other headphones? Because I know there's all these other factors that come in to making a headphone. Because I know each one's electrostatic and has so many different factors, and yeah, so but yeah, the tonality I think is really good, and when headphones kind of adhere to that kind of tonality target, it sounds tends to sound really natural. But yeah, I wanted to hear your insights on that. Oh, why that was chosen. So the, the tuning of the bows is different, first of all. So uh, HE1 is a 8090 with balls. So uh, HE90 was was created in the 80s, and at that time with frequency responses that goes down to the low frequencies were very well accepted, <laughs> sound very analytic. So when someone is hitting a drum, you hear uh, the overtones, but the fundamental tone is there, but not very loud. So that was, at that time, something, yes, very good. But of course, it could be made in a different way. Uh, and that's the HE1, so where, yes, bass tones are really well audible and you need a little bit more of bass than flat when you measure it because uh, you don't have the body channel. So when you listen to the speakers you have the channel through the chest and you don't have that when you're listening with headphones so there's a little bit more of bass in the HE1. And um, yes, the driver, when you measure the driver in a free field in an anechoic chamber with a measurement microphone, it's just flat. So there is no equalization in that case. The only equalization that is made is made by your own ear and by the ear pad. And of course, the ear pad needs to be in a way that it doesn't cause um, um, resonances, things like that. But that's all. So it is your personal equalization. And this is why it sounds so good, because you are listening to your own well-known personal equalization. And that happens because the uh, acoustical impedance of this thing is, it is very open. So everything that is reflected goes more or less. You have a very thin diaphragm, you have a very open um, uh, um, electrodes. It's going out. Not everything, of course. There is something that needs to be something. But it's, it's much more open than, than everything else. OK, in HD and HD 800 is very open as well. Uh, this is why it's perceived as a very good headphone in this Harman test as, as well. Uh, so acoustical impedance of the headphone plays a big role for how things are perceived. But of course, a ring radiator is not such a big uh, sound source like this really large diaphragm of an AG1. Okay. As, as a designer of uh, HD600 and HD800, after those came out, and obviously people really liked them, but then uh, shortly after it started the whole uh, movement, if you will, of people that uh, try to make all kind of improvements and mods. As the designer, I'm kind of curious, did you ever try to follow any of those mods and figure out whether or not those to your ears sound better than the original or you kind of just dismiss them and say... Of course I... <laughs> <laughs> I read, read these things um, and, and tried to, to uh, replicate that. And uh, uh, yes, and I, I um, when we made the HD 800 um, and we made the listening test and all that, we knew that it is a little bit much in the five kilohertz range, but acceptable. Everything that has been done by a lot of people to, to bring that down, that I've tried was not making the whole thing really better. 
and uh, we discussed a lot how to make that really better without losing high frequency response and so on and so on. And the solution was uh, the absorber. Uh, that is nothing unusual in microphones. <laughs> And when you're working in a, um, in a company which uh, on the next door are the microphone developers for dynamic microphones, uh, it, it took a while until we get to that idea to get that absorber in. But the good thing about the absorber is, uh, yes, it, it takes just the energy, energy out there and it takes it more out when it, there's more in. So that is uh, the good thing. I think that was the best solution. But there are still a lot of people say, okay, the original AG800 sounds much better to me than the AG800S. Thank you. Hi. Um, so you've mentioned acoustic opinions more than once. Uh, and I feel like it's something that's always kind of eluded me in terms of understanding. Um, I've heard people say it's a ratio of sound pressure to velocity, kind of an issue of acoustic permeability or, you know, whatever. Um, I guess my question is, it, can something like this be consistently measured? And if so, uh, what, if any, coherent single characteristic does it kind of lead to in terms of the sonic impression? Oh, yes, I think everything could be measured when you know, know what you want to measure. And you can, of course, measure uh, not only sound pressure, you can measure the airflow as well. Uh, there are measurements um, and the impact of that, how much that is in phase. And that plays a role, definitely. So uh, open headphone is, is not a pressure uh, center, but a, a velocity center. Uh, that plays a role, definitely. But, yeah. A lot of measurements takes a lot of time and have more side effects than you get really out of them. But develop, uh, the development of measurement technology is, is getting, yes, things are getting better. You get smaller microphones with low uh, or high signal to noise ratio. Normally uh, that is not possible. It was not possible with classical microphones, but yes, today. Uh, um, with the uh, surface mount devices, so for things, uh, for um, yes, the technology is developed very much for smartphones originally, but the, um, with these smaller microphones, the quality is going up as well. It's not perfect yet, but you can do very small microphones with a good signal to noise ratio already, so which, which is in the range of close to 80, hertz, uh, 80 dB, and that's not so bad. So, but yeah, as I, saw, as I said before, we are not at the end. Some people say, at Sennheiser as well, when I was working there, what do you want? We can produce headphones, they sound good, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sennheiser has just shut down the uh, development department. And not the development, the research department, sorry, the research department. And I think it's, it's important to have a research department and to do research on all these things. Wait, well, you said they shut it down? Yes, that's official. So like, uh, I don't tell you th uh, things that are no, uh, internal. I, I, I'm not longer with Sennheiser, but of course I have some, some friends there. And, uh, but all the important things, for example, for the HG 580 I was at that time always hanging around in the research department to just get information and, and to learn. That was my first headphone. And uh, yeah, so it's important to, to push the border to go to get better sound. So someone said uh, in his uh, presentation, I think what, that was Siegfried Lingwitz, I'm not sure, uh, that there's still a difference, and you can hear that, between a piano that is played and even it, if you're in the third floor and the piano is in the ground floor and you hear it through the corridor, you can hear it's a real piano. Mm -hmm. And it's not a speaker or something or it's a, you hear it from headphones. And until we are not there without seeing the thing, just by listening, say, okay, 
there's a really real piano somewhere and I have a headphone on my head. We are not there. So this is the way we need to go and every step is okay, there are steps back as well. The 2009 was a year, good year for headphones and a bad year for headphones. So uh, HD800 was presented and the Beats uh, solo was presented. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which was better? <laughs> <laughs> so when when you want just want to make the econo economical thing, the beat solo was far better. When you s see the impact of how much f fun you have with music, I hope it is the HD eight hundred. <laughs> okay, more questions? Any other questions? Um, I run online, which probably shouldn't listen to just one person, but people have said that headphones like the Utopia, the Verite, and the HD800S are approaching the limits of what a dynamic driver is capable of. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on that, and if in five years do you think I the market will be directly. mostly planar magnetic? Do you think we're shifting more towards the planar magnetic headphones? I think bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to know. Okay. Planners are very planners are very good, but they have their limitations. So they are good for home listening, yes, but they are have a weight. You can move with them as well. Uh, so Dan, Clark is standing back. So uh, when the whole design is made to make it lightweight, it's possible. But I think the dynamic drivers are, are not at their end. And w when you see all the, if, uh, on the efficiency way, uh, the, the weight thing and, and all that, so there is definitely place for, for dynamic drivers. And of course, dynamic driver is more, takes more time to develop it, it takes more time to do the production things for a dynamic driver. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not a wonder that the good drivers are only made by major companies. So for, for a company like me, uh, I don't have the, the, the money to, to develop dynamic drivers. I have to find good ones, and that's hard. Uh, when I can't develop them myself and produce them myself, there it is. There's the reason why uh, magnetic or electrostatics, that is easier to make for smaller companies. Uh, but, yeah, I think this, there will be, yes, a good mix of all kind of drivers. And maybe there's something we never thought about that will s solve a lot of problems in the future. So, talking about the future and say, okay, here's the limit. Bullshit. Um, as a consumer, you know, we, we often get inundated with uh, different types of measurements for headphones. Um, and uh, there's obviously a lot of like uh, hot debate over which measurements are relevant or which are not. So I'm kind of curious, um, you know, when, when you guys are, are developing headphones, what uh, measurements do you guys pay attention to? Because, um, you know, like some of the ones you hear in the community are like cumulative spectral decay. You know, um, attack, you know, attack bursts and, and stuff like that, um, along with obviously the the bread and butter frequency response curve. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious what you guys actually pay attention to. And I have a second question, um, uh, which is uh, if you had to pick uh, one, what, what's your favorite test track to test headphones with? Uh, you can go to the uh, Instagram account of of Grell. So uh, Everett has um, my test track is or my test tracks are there, and I think the commands why I choose things like that as well. There are things like Rockstar by uh, Nickelback as well, and <laughs> when that sounds good for a lot of listeners, uh, <laughs> then uh, you don't have too much between uh, yes four and six kilohertz. So things like that. Uh, so this is not because I like that mu music very much, uh, but because it shows something. And 
The next thing is all these measurements. Of course, distortion need to be low or the right dose of distortion to give the right thing. So this is something you're playing with, around with. Of course, um, the dampening of the whole system should be as good as possible. So it should not be in a one frequency range, something that is taking a long time to decay. So, uh, but you can see it as a resonance as well, because this is a resonance, because when somewhere is energy is kept in the system, you can see it in that diagram, but you can see it as a resonance as well. Uh, frequency response curves, God bless you, are <laughs> important as well, of course, but not without listening. So you are listening to something, uh, you say, okay, there's something wrong. Uh, is it not enough at 2K or is it too much at 1 or whatever? Then you do the measurements, you, um, you change something in the headphones, so dampening, whatever. And uh, then you measure again, say, okay, it has that effect that I have expected or not. But when it has that effect, you're listening to that again and say, no, no, that was not that what I really wanted to do. I have to change something else, things like that. So it's always, it's a creative process. It is it's, uh, science on one side, of course, and on the other side is still, yes, some kind of artist thing. But it is not only for that I like the headphone. In the end, um, there's some saying in German, I don't know if it works in, in English, uh, the worm needs to be tasty for the fish. Not for the fisherman. So, yeah, and as, so in this case, I'm the fisherman, and you're the fish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I ask a follow? Just a quick follow-up question. Um, so, uh, just a quick follow-up question. So, like, yeah, when, when you do, because I've noticed that myself. I mean, you can look at a graph, and you could say, oh, like the, the, the base extends to here or something, and it's not that elevated. But then maybe you put on some headphones, and it's like. Oh, this has more base than the graph would seem to indicate. For example, yeah, like so. What what is the disconnect between? Is there a disconnect between the the measurement rig and? No, there is not a disconnect. There, it, it is not the full picture. There, are, as I said before, you need to make much more measurements that affects the the sound that you perceive. It's not only frequency response. It is, as I said, one thing this acoustical impedance of the headphone, and that affects the hearing. So the, when you get a very close headphone on your ears, your uh, eardrum is getting stiffer, things like that. And then you hear something different way. So, yes, but yes, Dan. I, I, a lot of people don't even appreciate the fact that if you clench your jaw, you're changing the acoustic impedance of your ear canal, and literally you will change the sound of your headphones just if you clench your Yes, jaws. you can self-tune it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I keep trying to get my fixture to stop clenching its jaw, but it's, you know, it just doesn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Does Sunbuster have an issue, or not an issue, but like, have you ever noticed unit variation thing? Like, how do you deal with that? So when you produce something, headphones, cars, uh, <coughs> printers, whatever, there's always tolerances, always, serial tolerances. And one thing with acoustics is when you want to achieve tolerances as narrow as plus minus one dB, that's really very difficult. And because you have a lot of different materials that are not really made for being acoustical dampers. For example, you have some paper that is originally made for air filtering, and then you'd need to pick out the one uh, that has the right acoustical impedance. Um, I just said how the, um, so some guys at our booth, how um, the material that were used for the HD 580s, 600s, 650s, and so on, developed over the years. So it was first a black paper that was from a supplier who has a very high consistency of that material in acoustical impedance. Uh, then he stopped that process. We changed to a different paper that has, we have to 
pre-measure it and throw away a lot of that because in the end, uh, at the end measurements, uh, it need to fit into the limit curves, the whole thing. And so pre-measurement uh, is a good idea because this kind of filtering paper is, uh, to throw that away is che much cheaper than to throw away the whole acoustic path law of an HG580. And um, then we took some silk that has high consistency, but then they changed the process and that changed changed as well and a colleague uh, from the mechanical development department said, okay, I know a company in uh, southern Germany and they are doing uh, weight, they do woven things out of uh, stainless steel. And we used that for, yes, that was when we started to design HD 800 really. I had a different idea how to solve that, but, and then we said, okay, and this might be the right material for the 600s and 650s and so on as well. And so this is how that stuff comes in. And that is more stable. So that is specially calibrated to be stable. But on the other side, you have film for the diaphragms. And the thicker it is, the higher the resonance frequency, less low base you have, maybe a little bit more of the highs. There are a lot of things that have tolerances. Uh, and in the end, it's a big wonder that you have a good sounding headphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm beating a dead horse, but uh, since we're on the top, topic of the 580 um, and all the baffles, there's a lore to that headphone that's really strong. And uh, I just wanted to know was it ever made in Germany at one point? Or yes. Yeah? So that's official. That's Everybody, official, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was, that's official. It was. The HG580s were built in my hometown, Germany, Burgdorf, from 1993 to 1995. Okay. I'll ask another personal question. I have a friend who got a 580, a made in Germany sticker on his box, but then his headphone was made around. Did you get ripped off? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the wrong box. So when we changed production from, and I've been involved in that from, from Germany to uh, Ireland. We have changed everything. All the uh, markings on the headphone that were uh, in the tooling and, uh, and the packaging as well. So there might be, might have been some old parts uh, which, which uh, had made in Germany still on them and doesn't make no sense to throw them away. So. Okay. Because I know the Made in Germany badges exist, and they have an HE60, but it, it actually says Made in Germany. So. Yeah, so that was, yeah. And now there are headphones not made in Germany, so the Chinese make very good headphones, so it's, it's difficult to, to get that quality in, of parts uh, in Europe. So European plastic suppliers, for example, are used to make parts for cars. Things like that. And when I say, okay, I want to have a very precise part and it should look nice and, and like that, the price, I can get that in Germany, but the price is, is uh, 20 times higher than in, in China. And, and in southern China, where all the, uh, the whole supply chain is there for making headphones, it works very well with some suppliers. So, and uh, I think. Today, made in China for headphone is nothing I'm saying. It's great when it's made in Germany, it's great when it's made in the USA, and there are companies doing that, but that works only on the, on the high, higher price level. And when you're doing that, a lot of us, even when we're doing it in our home countries, are taking parts from China because they are bad. Not always. They have the logistics for it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, just one last one. Um, I can find a fair bit of information about tuning um, like a driver using filters, but not so much about how, let's say, the overall shape of the ear cup contributes to the sound. And I was wondering, especially with the case of like an open back headphone, if the cup itself is more of a more than just a means of like mounting the driver to the ear at a certain angle or, or distance. And so I was just wondering maybe changes that you could make to the 
shape of the cup itself that contributes to the overall sound that you're looking for. Yeah. So the first headphone, well, the most headphones in the 60s uh, were just round shaped. But when you have just a round cavity, all the diameters are the same length and you have a strong resonance when you have a closed one. So that is, is not the very best idea. It's a much better idea to have the geometry that is elliptical, then only through diame two diameters have the same length, or do something that is even different, like the Aeon, for example, shape, so that follows the ear, but the resonance could not occur that much. Uh, we did something similar at Zenaza as well, the kind of shape, and uh, yes, and now to the position of, of, of the drivers. Uh, as I said, it should, the, the, there should be a sound field that, yes, use your own individual geometrical filter when you're doing an over-ear headphone. And uh, yeah, so it's possible to do it with the driver over the ear. So when you look at the measured curve of a HE600 or 650 uh, on a dummy head and compare it with the uh, uh, measured curve of that dummy head's ear in, uh, yes, in a free field in, in the angle from 0 to 45 degrees and make the average of that. It's very similar. So that's achievable. So and, and that works even if you change the silicon ear. So yeah. So that is uh, with different geometric geometries. Uh, but when you bring the drivers more in f to the front uh, of the ear, you have this um, yes direction or directivity of the sound field more from the front. Um, to the rear, and one thing that doesn't happen when you you measure and, and listen to the HD650s is that you have this comb filter effect. Uh, and when, when you want to achieve that, you need to, to have, yes, the low frequencies going in earlier and the higher frequencies later. And that works only when the higher frequencies are reflected somewhere here. Uh, and that means the driver needs to be, yes, somewhere in front, more in front of the ear. And uh, yes. So. So uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. But if uh, anyone wants to continue the conversation in the hall, uh, we are uh, certainly OK to do that. And I urge you to visit Grell Audio's booth on the floor, obviously. So uh, please give a round of applause to our <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, it's really good to be back to Ken Jam. <laughs>